University of Toronto Research University. He has been invited here as a JCCC Scholar in Residence. JCCC Scholar in Residence actually is a program uh, that allows faculty members like me to bring in scholars from all over the world to, you know, to share their work uh, with JCCC staff, faculty, students, everybody. Okay. And of course, the community as well. Now, Dr. Kachura has a bachelor's degree in agricultural machinery from uh, Chakarova University. That's, I was going to say, Kukurova, it's actually Chakurova University, Turkey, and a master's degree in agriculture and biological engineering from Ohio State University. Okay. Now, Dr. Kachura has also been invited to speak at the Department of Agriculture and Biological Engineering from Ohio State University. Okay. And he has been involved in CEA in its control, environment, agriculture, research, and teaching for 17 years uh, in uh, Turkey, in Japan, and <coughs> Okay. And his first presentation is going to be on improving production quality and resource use by plant sensing and monitoring. Like if you have questions, do you want them to ask you when they have questions or do you want them to go back and ask you at the end? Mm, at the end. At the end. Okay. Yeah. So if you have mm. questions, write them down mm. so you can you know you can finish this talk on time. And really around here, so in our talking here, if you want to ask any questions after the talk, that's fine. And then we can keep 10 15 minutes. Or if not, we'll give you here for this next presentation. It's going to give another talk as well. Okay? So questions are always welcome, but after the talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rekha. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good, good morning. Good morning, everybody. It's a it's, uh, really a pleasure to be here uh, in uh, JCCC's uh, Scholar in Residence program and here with you today. Uh, if you allow me, I would like to first uh, thank uh, Dr. Rekha Sredhar uh, being a host for me, uh, inviting me here uh, for this uh, Scholar in Residence program. Uh, we met uh, with Lekha when she came to our short course last year in April uh, at the Control Environment Agriculture Center. Then we started discussions about uh, her program and, and invitation uh, then came after that. And I'm very happy to be here. I would like to also thank to uh, Pat uh, Decker and the JCCC Scholar in Residence Committee. Uh, Julie Haas, uh, Associate Vice President of the Marketing Communications, and also Peggy Graham, she's also in Scholar in Residence uh, program, uh, for their help uh, during this process. So um, today um, <clears throat> I'll be here in the morning, and this is our first uh, presentation, uh, and the second one will be at 10:30 on um, engineering challenges uh, and opportunities for sustainable. Uh, greenhouse uh, productions. Um, and also I was very sad to hear about the chips yesterday. <laughs> so, um, you were the uh, only unbeaten team, I guess, right? Yeah. So everybody's beaten at least once. Okay. All right. Well, uh, this morning, uh, Alika said that uh, we will have students and mostly from different uh, uh, programs, mainly horticultural sciences. So this talk is going to be more on some of the research that I have been doing uh, in the past and currently we're doing in my lab related to uh, plant sensing and monitoring and how we can use this approach to improve uh, plant quality and resource use efficiency in uh, controlled environment agriculture production. Um, I would like to first uh, show you uh, where I'm coming from, uh, Tucson, Arizona. It's just it's smacked in the uh, Sonoran Desert. Uh, we are very close to the uh, Mexican border. We are about 45, 50 minutes away from the border. Uh, it's a semi-arid climate. Uh, we have more than uh, 300 days of sunshine uh, during the year, abundant sunshine. That's sometimes advantageous, uh, sometimes uh, challenging to be in those, uh, that kind of climate. We have annual precipitation of about 300 millimeters. Our growing season starts from late August and we go up until the end of May and after that it's pretty much the bad time for uh, crop production um, in, in, in that climate. Um, this is uh, Tucson, Arizona. At night we are surrounded by four ranges of uh, mountains around the city that make it really interesting. Uh, I wonder if, if we didn't have that, what, how would Tucson look like? That's really interesting. Catalina Mountains. I think they reach up to uh, 9,000 feet high. It's interesting that uh, uh, you know during the winter, 
uh, you can swim in your pool and then go up to the Mount Lemmon ski resort in 35 minutes and there's you know snow on the mountain and you can enjoy skiing so that's really unique for that city um, city has uh, you know a lot to hope for interesting uh, uh, landscaping a lot of uh, uh, desert uh, plantation Mexican architectural influence uh, you can see in the city and surrounding the uh, state uh, we have very nice um, uh, trails uh, you can enjoy water uh, and uh, colorful architecture outdoors uh, cyclers you, you will see them uh, all over the place throughout the year and some historical sites uh, old Tucson studios I believe you heard about it it's a very interesting place so if you have a chance please visit if you haven't so far um, and enjoy enjoy Tucson and this is uh, my university, University of Arizona. I started uh, in the University of Arizona back in October 2007. Um, uh, I, my main department is Agriculture and Biosystems Engineering Department. The Controlled Environment Agriculture Center is a, uh, is a um, program under uh, Biosystems Engineering and School of Plant Sciences. And we are under College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Uh, at the center, we do research, uh, uh, teaching, and outreach. We have a multidisciplinary faculty team and, and staff working together to, to solve challenges in controlled environment uh, agriculture production. So university campus, we have about 40,000 students uh, on campus. I heard that uh, JCCC has about uh, 36,000, and that's huge. It's a really impressive uh, number. And by the way, I really like your campus. It's beautiful and facilities as well. Um, we are famous with, uh, uh, in, some, in some programs, uh, optical sciences, um, uh, astronomical sciences, uh, aerospace engineering. Um, this is uh, Mars Lander, you probably heard about it, and university uh, was a leading institute in that uh, mission, in the Phoenix uh, Mars mission program. Our swimming uh, team is, is kind of well known. Uh, this is Bio5 Institute. It's a multidisciplinary, multi-million dollar uh, institute uh, uh, working on biological sciences, uh, nanotechnology, biotech, uh, research and applications. And this is our team uh, uh, at the Controlled Environment Agriculture Center. We have four active members, active faculty members. Uh, Dr. Gene Giacomelli is the director of the center. He is also my colleague. We are in the same program, in the same uh, department, Ag and Biosystems Engineering. Dr. Cherry Kubota, she is a plant scientist from School of Plant Sciences. She does more work on plant physiology and plant response under controlled environment conditions. Uh, Dr. Patricia Raraba, she is also a plant scientist. She is more like a teaching, she has a teaching appointment as well as outreach uh, appointment. Uh, she teaches hydroponic courses. Dr. Mill Jensen, she, he is an emeritus professor from School of Plant Sci Sciences, and uh, he is the founder actual founding uh, person of the Controlled Environment Agriculture Center. We have uh, uh, technicians, um, electronics te technician. Uh, we have uh, postdoctoral researchers, Dr. Efren Fitz. He is in my lab working with me. Uh, uh, we have graduate students uh, also. Um, in my lab, I am working with David Story. He has a computer science background. He wanted to apply that exper experience and, and background in uh, controlled environment agriculture. Um, Efren, he also has electronics, electri electricity and electronics uh, engineering background and he wanted to go into controlled environment as well. Federico, uh, he is also doing his PhD in, in my lab. So as you can see, we, we are like a United Nations. We have people from all over the world uh, and it makes our program really, really uh, unique. And this is our center, if you look from the top. Um, we have uh, different sizes of uh, research facilities. Uh, we have uh, two gothic type greenhouses. They're about 2,700 feet square. These two greenhouses, they're identical in size and shape that allows us to do comparisons between different uh, uh, treatments and ex uh, experiments in these two greenhouses. Uh, right now I'm doing research here in, in uh, focusing on greenhouse cooling with natural ventilation and high, high pressure fogging systems. This greenhouse is our teaching greenhouse. It's a South Sioux design. Uh, this is the largest greenhouse we have, uh, about uh, 30,000 30, uh, 
you know, 3,000 feet square uh, greenhouse. Uh, Dr. Raraba teaches her hydroponic courses uh, for students. Students are dedicated a section in the greenhouse. They learn from seed to harvest. And their grading is based on their performance on the plant appearance as well as their scores on the tests. Um, we have small size greenhouses, uh, about 16 of them, and the size is uh, 1,200 uh, feet square. We have a retractable uh, roof greenhouse, uh, a medium tech greenhouse, uh, mostly uh, in that greenhouse nursery type of production, landscape uh, uh, um, architecture. Uh, faculty uh, do research and extension in that facility. Uh, this is our head house. We also have a class there where we do our preparations for the uh, planting and, uh, and also uh, give lectures uh, as well. This is our main building. It's like an adobe uh, type of structure, a Mexican style structure. Uh, we have offices and labs in this section of the building and this is a high tech state of the art uh, seminar room with web casting capabilities so we can webcast our seminars uh, to uh, outside of the university. And our offices are located here. We have an annex where we have our more labs and staff uh, and graduate students and postdoctoral researchers uh, residing. We also have storage facilities uh, here. Okay, well, let's start with the presentation. Uh, I, I wanna say that you know greenhouse production or controlled environment production is not new actually. If you look at the history, you would see some examples. Here are, is the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. 600 BC, uh, this is one of the one, seven wonders of the ancient world, and you can see uh, the, uh, the uh, cropping there. Uh, you know, we're talking about vertical farming, urban agriculture. You can see the first examples in the history. And if you can look at here, the early form of protected agriculture, they were pumping water from Euphrates River by chain, chain pumps. So we have examples in history. In Egypt, several hundred years BC, uh, they were using uh, water culture, now we call uh, hydroponics, uh, back in the history. Uh, the first uh, known use of controlled environment agriculture uh, was back in 1437 uh, AD. Cucumbers were grown in, uh, in covered structures with transparent rock called mica uh, for the Roman Emperor Tiberius. So you would see some examples of controlled environment agriculture uh, in that time period. So why greenhouses? Why do we do production in, in greenhouses? Uh, first, improved independ independence uh, from outside climate. We can control the environment for uh, desired conditions. We can grow year around. We are not dependent in the uh, climate. Uh, we can use unproductive land. We can grow crops anywhere actually uh, on earth and beyond. But of course there's a cost associated with that. Uh, but it is possible, it is controlled environments. Uh, we can use resources more efficiently, such as water, fertilizer, uh, labor. Uh, they, it can be more efficient compared to a field operation. Actually, in greenhouse operations, the water use efficiency is, for, for example, uh, 10 to 15 times better than the outside, the, uh, the field operations. Uh, we have more control over pest and disease uh, infestation in greenhouse plant production. The societal effects. The greenhouse production can provide steady year-around jobs for people. So there are there's societal aspects as well. And we can increase production and quality uh, by considerable amounts. Of course, if you compare field operation, the, the, you, you can have superior income per unit uh, growing area basis uh, in controlled environment plant production. So let's define controlled environment agriculture um, or protected agriculture. Uh, some people say it is defined as an integrated science and engineering approach to establish the most favorable environmental conditions for plant productivity. In this process, we try to optimize resources, including water, energy, space, and capital and labor so we can provide desired plant product or biological processes under controlled uh, environment settings. This could be a, a very nice uh, uh, definition for controlled environment agriculture. And this, this sketch actually summarizes what are the challenges uh, for a greenhouse uh, operator or grower. You against mother nature and the rest of the world. Here, the poor guy trying to manage his operations 
Uh, there are a lot of things going on outside. You know, people might wonder, you know, what, where the, does the problem is coming from? And if we are not efficient in our operations, we, we would be wasting our resources and our capital. So we've got to pay attention to how we operate the greenhouse. Some people might be watching over uh, on your shoulder and maybe trying to, you know, make money. So it uh, would be really advantageous to know your system, know your operation, so you can make a better judgment decision, so you can save money uh, in your uh, business. Um, some, you know, researchers, uh, uh, scientists, uh, they are looking from a distance, trying to identify what the problem is. Uh, maybe we should get closer to the grower and try to identify the problems and try to work together to solve some of the challenges. So that sketch is a, just a summary. But if you look at the, um, uh, the technology in the world, you might see different examples from very simple operations, very simple primitive technologies, uh, low-tech greenhouses, uh, to up to very high-tech greenhouses, and there are driving forces for this uh, 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 selection for the design and technology. One of them is the market size and infrastructure in that particular region. You know, what kind of uh, structure, market we have? The climate of the site. The climate is different uh, all over the world, so that makes um, uh, that's one of the factors on your uh, design selection. Plant requirements. Plants have, different plants have different uh, climatic needs for you know, um, optimal uh, growth. Water quality and availability. It's really important, the quality of your water in your location. And it's availability, how much you have and for how long you have. That's an important criteria. The cost of the land. Do you have uh, a favorably uh, nice land and with a reasonable cost so you can establish your business? Availability and zoning restrictions, this, these are important uh, parameters. Uh, sometimes you might run into zoning restrictions that, that really makes it challenging for you to do your operation or to use some of the technologies that you need in the greenhouses. Uh, <clears throat> availability of materials, equipment and services. Level of education and training of the labor. This looks maybe simple but it is really really important and this was one of the reason actually one of the uh, 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 corporate greenhouses in Arizona uh, filed bankruptcy and what this this was one of the uh, the reason that uh, they went for bankruptcy not steady and well educated labor force that they could apply uh, in their use in their uh, facilities uh, legislations, uh, food safety issues, chemical residues, emission of uh, chemicals to the soil, water and air. These are very important uh, factors. And supporting infrastructure. Do we have infrastructure that will help you to uh, ease your operations? And also capital availability for investment and economics uh, are the uh, factors. Let's look at the, the world uh, greenhouse production areas a little bit. Some of these are outdated, uh, but it wouldn't change the, the order here. Total uh, greenhouse area uh, in some of the major greenhouse production countries, China has huge amount of land. And uh, uh, this is, by the way, excluding the uh, high tunnel, uh, uh, sorry, low tunnel greenhouses. It's greenhouse, you know, a person can comfortably go in and work. We, we will define it as a greenhouse uh, production. And Japan, Korea, Spain, Turkey, Italy, U.S., we are uh, number seven? Yeah, number seven. And I just looked at this last night. I was doing some calculations on that paper. We actually, we had more uh, area uh, back in 2002, about 12,000 uh, uh, hectares. Now we're down to 11,000. Uh, and Netherlands, um, the world's leading um, country in terms of the use of technology, the high-tech greenhouses, uh, Netherlands is the uh, region in the world for that. France and Israel. And if you look at the Europe, uh, this is the order in Europe in terms of greenhouse uh, production. Uh, so this just gives us a, a, an impression about the scale of the operations going on around the world. 
This is showing only the tomato production in North America. Uh, I'm coming from Arizona. We do mostly vegetable production compared to northern climates and eastern part where floriculture uh, production is going on. But this is interesting because if you look at the vegetable production in North America comparing US, Canada, Mexico, Canada and US, the Canada at the acreage is pretty much steady. You know, there's not much increase, uh, even a little bit of a decrease in the greenhouse operation areas. But if you look at the Mexico, the, it, it increases dramatically, exponentially. If we really check this number, I believe this is around right now seven to 8,000 hectares today in Mexico. The reason for that, because they have also favorable climate, they have uh, low labor cost, and you know, that's why they are able to increase their operations dramatically. And it makes it really challenging for US and Canada to compete with that. Uh, that's why we need more um, uh, resource use efficient systems so we can make the operation competitive against that low labor cost uh, operations. So, so these are some of the challenges uh, in greenhouse agro ecosystem uh, all over the world, but especially in developing countries. Uh, God bless you. Uh, steady rise of energy and resource inputs. Um, in operations, the climatic change, increasing importance and pressures on the environmental issues, um, sanitary requirements, food safety issues, uh, limited resources, and new bioaggressors. These are the challenges that are facing, uh, that are faced by the growers, and uh, it's making, uh, it's forcing growers to come up with smarter, more resource use efficient uh, uh, systems in their operation. If you look at the history, uh, we would see more traditional systems. The greenhouse designs and operations, the hardware, were only to control the greenhouse climate automatically. This was in, in 20th century uh, you know, greenhouse operations, selecting the most uh, efficient um, hardware to provide uh, the desired conditions. But if we're going to be seeing more in the 21st century on uh, resource reutilization, and reuse of regenerating resources to use again in greenhouse operations. So what we are seeing right now is sustainable production systems uh, and instruments uh, to make the operation more resource conserving, uh, environmental friendly, economically viable, and socially supportive, and, uh, and commercially competitive. Um, the main uh, difference between an open field operation and controlled environment plant production is that we have almost a complete control on both demand and supply conditions in controlled environment plant production. However, this makes it necessary for us to use, um, uh, to come up with better understanding uh, of the interactions between the plant and microclimate so we can develop energy efficiency we can uh, be more efficient, more resource conserving, uh, and we can come up with strategies to establish that in controlled environment agriculture systems. Uh, we can achieve resource savings and production quality if we are able to come up with um, uh, plant responses. Uh, some of, uh, we can come up with control strategies based on plant responses, include plant response in the climate control strategy. Uh, that would make the operation more uh, efficient. And in this complex system, you can see a lot of uh, uh, things are happening, a lot of exchanges between the plant and uh, environment, microclimate is happening. Um, when you look at the, the sensing or the climate control in greenhouse operations, traditionally the macroclimate is controlled. Air temperature, relative humidity, and radiation. radiation. Um, through the climate control system. However, the microclimate surrounding the plant or the boundary layer, the leaf boundary or canopy layer, controls the exchange processes in, in greenhouse operations. And the most energy efficient, uh, energy efficient systems are those who have a direct control on the microclimate compared to a macroclimate uh, control system. So it would make more sense to focus on the plant and the surrounding boundary layer to make the operation more energy efficient. And a lot of things are happening in that microclimate. So we've got to understand this interaction really well. Um, um, plants has uh, a very unique way of communicating with us. They, 
uh, we can look at their response under different uh, climatic conditions and try to understand their needs. Uh, this approach is called speaking plant approach. You know, we can let plants tell you what they need and when they need and how much they need. If we can establish that, I think we would be more uh, resource use efficient in our operations. However, if you look at the uh, 20 years of history of speaking plant approach, there are still challenges. The challenge in terms of sampling from the plant and trying to make a representation out of that large space, trying to use low cost uh, sensor networks uh, to obtain the data that would make sense and also interpret that data so we can uh, you know, take actions to make uh, corrections on the settings in the greenhouse to make the plants happy. Um, there are, <clears throat> so we, what we need is to establish an autonomous real-time plant monitoring, plant health and growth monitoring system. And in order to do this in real time, we need um, a non-contact sensing techniques so we can do autonomous production because some of these techniques you're seeing here or the sensors are contact sensors they will need destructive measurements and they're mostly for research purposes not for commercial settings uh, deep point potentiometers uh, for water to, to, to determine the water potential in the leaves chlorophyllic concentration dendrometers to look at the diameter change in the uh, stem uh, sap flow meters to look at the uh, crop uh, water use in real time uh, and, and leaf parameters to look at this tomato resistance and conductance to to see how tomato aperture is being regulated and the tensiometers to measure the soil water content the soil water potential actually to decide you know the, the soil conditions uh, how wet how dry is the soil so they are challenging to to establish in real time uh, crop monitoring or uh, greenhouse system monitoring so we need non-contact, non-destructive systems to do this. Um, with the advancements in sensor and computer technology, micro-precision uh, has been available. When we talk about micro-precision, we don't mean really a high uh, uh, order of engineering, but we refer to a technology uh, which determines uh, what is needed how much is needed and, and when is needed. So that's uh, the micro-precision technology we need. So after determining uh, these uh, components, then we can take actions uh, to determine the plant needs quantitatively and, and qualitatively. Some of the available uh, micro-precision techniques were uh, speaking plant approach, artificial intelligence, biorobotics, and biomechatronics. Again, some of these also require destructive uh, measurements. Uh, again, what we need is a non-contact uh, sensing and plant monitoring system for real-time operations. When we look at the uh, <coughs> greenhouse environment, in reality, it is, it is really non-uniform. Um, you see variation in, uh, in greenhouse climate and uh, for we, for, for, to determine the plant status, we need um, uh, sampling. Uh, a lot of samples from the uh, production domain. So a plant monitoring system must have uh, capability, autonomous uh, monitoring capability, reducing the number of samples uh, and also considering the continuum, looking at microclimate, uh, the plant itself and the growing media. Maybe not just the plant because this is a continuum. Root zone, the plant itself and the microclimate. If we have capability in terms of monitoring this continuum, then we can make a better judgment uh, in our processes. Just as an example, I was doing my research uh, at the time I was working with New Guinean patients. They are low uh, transpiration plants. Um, and we were monitoring soil moisture on a very hot, sunny day. And the soil moisture sensor said, perfect, it's wet. You know, you don't need irrigation. But when we came to the greenhouse, we saw that they, they were dead. The reason for them being dead was they have a certain a capacity to transpire. Their engine doesn't work that fast to keep up with the demand which is coming from the solar radiation. So they get light saturated and they were dead. So it would be more, it would be better to look at soil conditions as well as the uh, measurements from the plant that then we could maybe catch that timely and then correct that uh, 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 situation. 
Um, so I'm going to go through some of the uh, examples on how we can use non-contact sensing. I will start with water stress detection. Then I will describe some uh, approach that we use right now for nutrient uh, deficiency detection with non-contact sensing techniques. Um, for water stress detection, uh, let's define it first. Uh, there is a demand and there is a supply conditions for, for water, for, uh, for plants. And supply condition is pretty much driven by the, the water availability in the soil or the, the growing media. The demand, uh, the driving force there is the solar radiation for water uptake and vapor pressure deficit between the air, surrounding air, and the, and the stomata, the vapor pressure difference between them. And some of the resistances called stomatal resistance, how the stomatal aperture is regulated, and aerodynamic resistance. Uh, which is mainly affected by the uh, boundary layer and the uh, wind uh, velocities around the plant. So those are the main driving forces. So for water stress, if the demand, theoretically speaking, if the demand exceeds supply conditions, then we have the incipient water stress. Or if the plant is not capable of extracting enough water to meet the demand in the case of New Guinea impatience, then we would see uh, the symptoms of uh, um, plant water stress. So I'm going to go through two uh, different approach that I use, I, I, I worked with. Uh, one of them is infrared thermometry or thermography, and the other one is machine vision, computer vision, to look at the canopy architectural change. Uh, in the temperature-based uh, detection through infrared thermometry, we look at the uh, plant energy balance through transpiration. We know that transpiration is the evaporative cooling mechanisms of the plants. They sweat and they cool themselves, like us. You know, if you sweat, we cool. Um, the concept here is if the plant is stressed, then the transpiration rate would be less compared to a well-watered plant. And, and then in that case, we would expect that the temperature of the stressed plants or the canopy temperature would be higher than a well-watered plant. So we can make an argument that the temperature uh, of the canopy or leaf is a good indicator of plant's water status. So under unlimited water conditions, we have potential evapotranspiration. Under water limiting conditions, we have actual uh, uh, evapotranspiration. And the ratio of this two, the ratio of actual evapotranspiration to potential evapotranspiration, can give us an index called crop water stress index. So we can determine the level of stress, water stress, on the plant. This index gives us a number to chain ranging from 0 to 1. Being close to 0 means a, a well water plant. Close to 1 means a severely stressed plant. But where do we define our boundary? You know, at what value we say, OK, now we started getting the stress, and we need to initiate the irrigation. That's what we need. We need to define a threshold in this, in this range to be able to automate the irrigation. So this is what we did in one of our research. We were trying to use infrared thermometry application and come up with a threshold value for a particular crop that we were working with. In that case, it was New Guinea impatient. So based on that number, we can automate the irrigation. And to be able to do that, there are two different approaches. One is the empirical approach, and the other one is theoretical approach. The theoretical approach for crop water stress index research includes uh, plant energy balance, and it's all thermodynamics. The energy input to the plant, the energy leaving the plant, and the energy storage in the plant. So if you look at this um, <coughs> balance and then make it more detailed, the energy coming uh, and available for the plant is solar radiation. The energy leaving from the leaf or canopy is latent heat of uh, uh, latent heat, the transpiration component, and the sensible heat here, and, the, um, and the, uh, the heat generation in the canopy. Going further into details, there are some resistances uh, associated with that, the ratio of stomatal resistance to aerodynamic resistance. And this uh, prime here is coming from a well water plant, and the rest uh, is from the stress plant. And you can determine that ratio depending on other factors, as I mentioned before vapor pressure deficit, temperature difference between the canopy and air, some psychrometrics uh, values from psychrometric calculations, solar radiation and leaf area index values, 
then going through these calculations, we are able to determine the crop water stress index. To establish that, we need some measurements. We need the measurement of leaf area index continuously, the canopy temperature, air temperature, air humidity, uh, so we can uh, continuously monitor and determine the CWSI value. In the empirical approach, uh, it's slightly different. Uh, when you look at the numbers, the values of the d temperature difference between the canopy and air, and if you plot that against the vapor pressure deficit, there is a negative, there is an inversely linear relationship between these two parameters for a well-watered plant, and it looks like that. So we need to establish that by making measurements from a healthy, well-watered plant. And opposed to that, we also look at a severely stressed plant and come up with this curve called upper limit line. And the relationship between the T TC minus TA is independent of vapor pressure deficit for a severely stressed plant. So we define first our upper limit and lower limit experimentally. And for a plant with some water limiting conditions should deviate between these two lines. And then if you make measurements, it would look like that. So if you look at the distance to the lower limit and the, the distance between the upper and lower limit, and if you look at that ratio, that also gives us the crop, crop water stress index. But this approach requires a preliminary analysis to define those upper and lower limits. So this is the empirical approach to determine crop water stress index. So what we did, we used the uh, theoretical approach. We monitored the plant temperature, air temperature, vapor pressure deficit, and all other parameters that were needed. We let the New Guinean patients go through several stress cycles. In this case, we stressed them three times. And then when we observed the stress by looking at the canopy from an expert uh, uh, grower, uh, we visually detected it and we irrigated again. We allowed the plants to recover from that stress and then continue the growth. So this is what's happening here with the crop water stress index values. This is a well-watered plant, green line, close to zero. And the uh, water stress index for the uh, stress plant going up to 0.8. This is probably the usual stress detection, then irrigation, and it goes back. And you're looking at the evapotranspiration of the plant from a well-watered plant in the blue line and, and degrees on that evapotranspiration rate from a stress plant. Uh, we said, OK. We visually observed, but we want to come up with a technique or system, monitoring system, which is capable of determining the incipient water stress. You know, the threshold, okay, I, I realize that now the plant has problem, let me irrigate. So that was uh, the, the number that we were after. And through some statistics, going through coefficient of variation of uh, changes in this, uh, we were able to determine that threshold. And then with that threshold, we were able to detect uh, uh, crop water stress uh, one to two days prior to visual detection. So you wouldn't see the stress symptoms on the plant, but the, the, uh, the plant monitoring system was capable of doing that and actuate the irrigation. Well, we said this is too complicated. If a, gr a greenhouse grower would try to use it, then it would require a lot of components and all those resistances and everything. It wouldn't be practical. So we said, let's come up with a, a simpler system. So we created this uh, uh, simple system uh, with only using a canopy temperature sensor, an infrared, temper uh, inf infrared thermocouple, an air temperature sensor, and a relative humidity sensor. Um, and we had some actuators and a data logger to monitor those uh, in real time and then make decisions on the, based on the number, the threshold number that we came up with. So we had one control group, one stressed uh, uh, New Guinean patient group. Here are the actuators, here is the data logger. We were monitoring these parameters. The data was collected continuously. We calculated the CWSI on the uh, uh, data logger itself. The data logger also had that threshold value and check the condition, if we are stressed or not, based on the threshold value, and then uh, actuate the irrigation uh, in this line and keep monitoring all these parameters again in a loop. So based on these two different uh, irrigation scheme, the CWSI-based uh, irrigation control saved almost 50% uh, of water used in the operation and when you look at the differences in the plants, there is no statistical difference in terms of the flower number and the, uh, and the plant uh, parameters. 
So based on plant responses, we were able to save resources in this uh, system. OK, so this was infrared thermometry. Now I'm going to switch to um, uh, computer vision system and how we can take advantage of the plant appearance and then make uh, judgments on the uh, plant status. So vision allows humans to perceive and comprehend the world around them. However, it's not perfect all the time in terms of size and color and, and shape. When you look at this figure, I believe you experience that you know these lines, the blue lines, are not looking straight. They're not parallel, right? Are they looking kind of bended in the middle a little bit, maybe? Some of you may have a perfect vision uh, and say parallel. But if you look at them, uh, really, um, this is, by the way, called hearing straight lines. They are parallel in, in reality. But our eyes kind of uh, not really capable of uh, differentiating that. Just look at these red lines and travel around it. You would see some of these are just spinning, right? The circle. They're not static. They're dynamic, even though they're static images. But your eyes are kind of confusing you that they're moving around. And size perception. Human vision is not really perfect in terms of size and measurement. These figures look smaller here, right, and the bigger here when you first kind of take a look at it, even though they are same in size. Um, and color perception. Human eye cannot perform well with color. I believe you're, you, you, you see this lighter than this one, looking darker, right? And in reality, they are the same color. So um, if we were to make judgments on, by monitoring different things, we would not really make a perfect judgment. However, the machine vision, the computer vision is not like that. They perform tasks again and again, and they do with higher precision. Okay? So we can take advantage of that. And this is the concept behind using a computer vision and machine vision to do that. It's a non-invasive, non-contact technology enabling direct monitoring from the plant with improved sensing capabilities by electronically perceiving and understanding an image with multi-dimensional capabilities. Those capabilities would be morphological parameters, size, shape, and texture. We can identify that. Spectral information such as color, temperature, and moisture. We can also look at temporal uh, uh, trends such as growth rate, development, changes in spectra, and morphological states. Here's an example of a plant, the New Guinean patient plant that we used uh, in that water stress research. This New Guinean patient plant is going through a stress cycle, and you can see the turbulent pressure change on the plant, right? It collapses. When we irrigate them, it continues growing. And if you look at the top projected canopy area, or the, the dynamics of that plant movement, um, when it's going that stress cycle, you would see those changes on the plant. It collapses and it recovers back. So if a sensing system with computer vision is able to identify this dynamics, then we can use that to automate uh, some of the operations or help grower to make a judgment. Um, here is the technique behind image processing and computer vision with this approach. We have an original image. Uh, the camera takes images at given intervals, maybe 10 minutes. It takes several images. In this case, we were taking five sequential images less than a second, averaging those five images and have a representative image for that instantaneous moment. And after that, since it has some noise in it, noise being data loggers, cables, or anything that we want to see uh, to evaluate, through image processing applications, we cut and eliminate those. Then you end up with this kind of image, and we need to separate the, the target, which is plant, from the background, and then do our analysis on that. So further image processing application by looking at the image histogram that shows the frequency of gray level tone distribution in this case. And we can use that image histogram to come up with a threshold value that separates the background from the image, because you see here is white background with a gray tone on the canopy. Uh, in the image histogram, you would see only two peaks, one representing the, the white background and the other one a huge peak uh, representing the plant. And in the middle, there's nothing, so we can pick a threshold to separate that. So after that is separated, we, only, uh, we have the canopy portion. Then going through some statistical uh, operations, we can determine the percentage movement and coefficient of variation of that uh, plant parameter, in this case, top projected canopy area, 
from a standard from a, a mean uh, uh, canopy area change on the plant. So using that uh, information and looking at the trends, here is the canopy movement percentage. Red one is the uh, well water plant. White is the stress plant. And uh, you can see it's like a heartbeat. And those are the stress cycle. And here when you see the plant visually with stress symptoms. Uh, top projected canopy area change, turgor pressure reduced, collapse plant, and then irrigation then continuous movement. And when you do the statistical analysis, this is what you see on the healthy plant, canopy coefficient of variation, and we would see this uh, and peaks when you experience the uh, water stress on the plant. Again, we used further statistics to identify a threshold value uh, for this parameter to be able to identify the incipient uh, water stress occurrence for the system to actuate irrigation. And with that approach, we were able to detect a you know, couple of hours, in this case 10 to 15 hours before it was visually uh, detectable by the uh, uh, system. So infrared thermometry uh, performed better uh, compared to a computer vision system to determine the water stress and automate irrigation. So there has been a lot of research um, uh, to look at single leaf, look at the single leaf lat, maybe single leaf to detect uh, irrigation, uh, to, uh, to water stress, to, uh, to automate irrigation, sensing from a plant. Uh, however, uh, it would still require large sampling, you know, in the greenhouse settings. Uh, so what would be more desirable uh, to reduce the cost and also to make it more efficient is to look at the whole canopy or to sample from a larger area. So it would be more desirable to sense from a canopy. Uh, with different um, uh, markers, different sensing systems. Now, we have been working with uh, this machine vision system. We designed and developed a machine vision system to determine the calcium deficiency induced tip burn on lettuce crop grown in high, uh, floating hydroponic system. And then we wanted to do a detection from a canopy rather than looking at a single leaf and single plant by looking at the color changes on the plant by looking at the temporal changes, good growth patterns, and by looking at the textural change on the plant uh, to make judgment on the stress conditions. Um, we used uh, computer programming to do that. Uh, so it's a custom built program to look at all the environmental parameters as well as taking images and registering it on the database to determine uh, the color change and the textural change on the plant. And this process is a continuous process. The camera goes to a point and comes back and travels uh, back and forth continuously. Um, and it calculates everything and registers the data in the database. You can see the operation in real time camera is moving and the canopy images are uh, shown for the operator on the go, on the, uh, on the GUI. Uh, it gives us a good telepresence capability to see what the system is doing. And we can also use this system for phenotyping purposes uh, as well. Um, so we did some uh, calcium stress uh, induction experiments in the greenhouse. Control group, no stress. Treatment group had some calcium deficiency in it. And then we kept, kept taking images from the uh, canopy to determine, uh, let the system determine what the uh, stress level is. And here is a two different uh, floating hydroponic system. In this system, the, the plants are, the lettuce plant is floating on the, uh, on the water. The advantage is saving resources because the fertilizer and water stays there all the time and we can do year-round production. This, uh, the plant here uh, is ready to be harvested and on this end uh, the, you can have small seedlings you can harvest at the other end and replace the platform and keep going, keep adding new plants to be able to do year-round production. That's the uh, advantage about this system. So all the parameters are monitored, images were taken and uh, we look at an original image. We did some image processing to separate the, the plant portion from the background. And once we have the, this only plant portion, we did some analysis on determining perimeter, uh, some uh, physical dimensions of the plant. We used a co-occurrence matrix, basically looking at the textural change uh, and looking at the pixel and the, how that pixel is, is, is uh, changing on that um, pixel domain or the picture domain. Because if you look at a checkerboard type of picture, you could have the same gray level distribution if you look at a half black and half white image, right? That would give you the same uh, gray level 
change if you look at only color. But if you look at the texture, you could see the difference between a checkerboard or a half white, half black image. That's the idea behind looking at the texture. So through these textural features, we used only energy, entropy, contrast, and homogeneity. They are basically how the pixel is, is distributed in that image. Let's not look at the, the mathematical uh, numbers uh, the, or equations there. Uh, we are looking at the randomness, the brightness of that texture, and, and the, the distribution of that picture. And when you plot those changes through the stress cycle, these are the changes for a control plant, no calcium deficiency, and this is a calcium deficient plant. The stress was induced here on the sixth day, and the visual observation on the stress plant was, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, it was visible to the operator on the 11th day. And here is the brightness, how the brightness value changed as we went through the stress cycle and the entropy change, the energy change. But again, we wanted to determine a threshold. We used, this, again, statistical approach to define where was the breaking point. And if you do the statistics, you would clearly see that the breaking point was on the day nine. So compared to a visual operation, the system was able to determine that occurrence about one day or, or earlier than the visual detection. So. Um, there are different sensing techniques that we can utilize. We can use hyperspectral imaging, thermal imaging, fluorescence imaging, and 3D surface image sensing or LIDAR type of sensing detection techniques to uh, look at the plant changes. So there are wide ranges of stress. One stress symptom might be due to a particular stress. They might give you the same stress symptom, and that makes it challenging to identify uh, the stresses. That's why we need uh, a sensing system which has multi-dimensional capabilities. Uh, it can give us uh, uh, different markers. Uh, it's like um, doing a remote sensing in greenhouses. Remote sensing in field operations are common. It has been done. But can we do the same thing in greenhouse, under greenhouse operations? Have layers of information and then use it to come up with one single image which can tell us you know, what the plant status is. That, w that is our ultimate goal in our, uh, in our plant sensing and monitoring uh, research. So this is going to be our direction. We have been working with these capabilities. We want to increase our capability in thermal sensing and fluorescence sensing and come up with a remote decision support system using remote sensing application to give a grower or operator an image like this using all these layers of information and come up with an image the red spots are being, imagine that this is your greenhouse domain, red spot is telling you that the plant is not healthy there and the green ones are telling you that the plant is healthy there. Uh, just to make the grower, to, to, to help him or, or her to make a better decision. So there are a lot of interest in terms of using information technologies in greenhouse operations. So we will be seeing a lot of uh, use of uh, greenhouse automation with multi-sensor platforms, plants response-based sensing and control, wireless technologies, it's really attractive right now. And uh, it has applications in nursery operations, in greenhouse operations, as well as in field operations. So we would see more of that in, in controlled environments. Distributed microcontrollers, web cameras. Now growers would like to have an access to their greenhouse when they're traveling, just to have information coming from the greenhouse, either to them or to their advisors, so they can make quick, you know, very efficient, timely uh, judgments and, and take corrective actions. Remote supervisory systems, remote e-advising is going to become really uh, uh, important. Um, remote support and troubleshooting. So that is called actually a telepresence. Telepresence is the technological application and practice which can provide you sufficient and valuable information uh, either for you or for your advisors to operate devices and hardware from a remote uh, location in real time. The goal here to obtain the information with some intelligence and capabilities using machine vision approach or some other non-contact sensing techniques. That information leads to a knowledge and then that knowledge can lead to clear understanding of a situation then we can implement a control to complete an operation. Therefore we can enhance or mitigate a situation. Uh, so we can sustain or improve the distant production systems through environmental monitoring, controlling, decision support, crop system diagnostics, and distance education and e-advising. 
Uh, here's an example of that telepresence application we use in our center. We have a system called Tomato Live System. We can have remote access to each individual greenhouse um, and look at the data coming from the system. We can look at the graphs, look at the crop water status, daily growth rate. So you can establish all these through um, uh, telepresence. And right now, let's try to attempt to connect our greenhouse. This is one of our research greenhouses. This is the one that I'm doing research. So I am able to see in real time right now the history of the changes in soil radiation, carbon dioxide levels, air temperature, humidity, vapor pressure, deficit, and you can add, add to these parameters uh, as you wish. And I'm able to see my greenhouse here, and if I click on live mode here, you can do this also from your computer. Uh, you don't have to have a password. Uh, right now we are doing an experiment in this greenhouse, that's why have, we have a password protection. But I will give you um, uh, the web address so you can have access to it and check us out. So we are right now connected live to our greenhouse. You can see this it's moving. So you can control and look at the overall canopy. Uh, you can look at a close-up image from a plant. There you go. You can zoom out and maybe you want to see your bambus bees working in there or the or the leaf or the flower and this way you know you can you can closely work with your plant and this is really powerful and maybe sorry can you, look at any plant? you can look at any plant in the range of, in the range of the camera yeah yes and uh, you can go back and look at your Maybe if you have a computer there, zoom into the computer screen and then look at the data. You can look at your operator working in there. If he or she identifies a problem and calls you up, say, okay, well, Murat, I have a problem. What do you say? Let me look at the plan first and then you get a close shot. Your operator is right there or manager. You can say, okay, do this and do that. And that's actually what we're doing right now with the South Pole Growth Chamber. We have a South Pole Growth Chamber operated by Raytheon Company. However, uh, our center provides the technical assistance for that. Uh, that was established back in 2005. And through satellite communication, we have an operator there. If they have a problem, they call us back, and then we give them in real time technical assistance. We say, okay, check the heating, ventilation, air conditioning system, look at this coil, copper coil, and change different things. And, and we can actually interfere with the system and change the set points from there. So this is telepresence, uh, and you can add audio to this as well uh, with the technology right now we have. Uh, so this is an application of telepresence and uh, it will be really helpful. Um, we can use these kind of telepresence applications in earth applications. I just wanted to show this uh, research uh, information for you. This is our lunar greenhouse uh, design. We are working with uh, greenhouse designs for earth application. We are also working designs for applications beyond the Earth. And uh, um, the astronauts for long space missions, they need a sustainable system. They need water, they need oxygen, and they also need food for their dietary needs. So either you take it with you, which is really expensive, it requires a space to store that and ship it, or we can use plants as bioregenerative life support system. Uh, for them to have water, uh, uh, food, and also oxygen. So this is our inflatable lunar greenhouse. It inflates and it deflates. When it's deflated, it's about uh, three, four feet. It's a lightweight structure, aluminum. It can be deployed automatically uh, from a distance. Um, and the, there's a cable culture system here. Uh, it can be also, it's like an accordion system, and the water flows through it, and the seeds could be placed there initially and you can uh, initiate the system by a push of a button from a remote location then you can start the plant uh, growing in that system um, as you can see in the full um, operation uh, the system looks like this it's like a jungle but the purpose of that to have the largest biomass which can transpire so we can harvest that transpiration water from the air 
through heat exchanger and harvest that and then use it as a potable water or use it back in the hydroponic system as a water resource. They generate oxygen, right? So we can capture that oxygen and the astronauts can use it. And we are also growing plants in there. In this case, we were looking at NASA candidate crops such as sweet potato, tomato, lettuce, and strawberries. So they can harvest it and, and use it for their dietary needs. So three components and biogenerative life support system. We got some funding from NASA. In the first phase, we were uh, required to determine the technical and scientific feasibility and merit of the system, how much biomass we can produce, how much water we can harvest, and how much oxygen we can generate, and how much crew time we need. Because when you deploy the system, astronauts doesn't have t they don't have time to go with a hose and irrigate or you know or harvest. You know they have other complex tasks to do. So we want the system to operate on its own as much as possible. So that's why we were interested. NASA was interested in how much time it requires to maintain this system. So we put this huge uh, 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 module on, on load cells, and we were able to monitor the biomass growth and also detect you know, when somebody walks in there, we see a peak, and we say, OK, this is the time that was needed in this uh, time period for operating the system. We, uh, uh, we are about to finish this first phase, and we are uh, competing against 18 stations, 18 institutions in the United States right now for the second phase to get more funding. And we need to be among the four, the four top uh, institutions to get the second funding. And we are going to Johnson Space Center in a couple of weeks to defend our data and then get, for, get, and, and get more funding if possible. We get a lot of publicity uh, in the media. You might run into this on the web. Uh, 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 National Geographic's different TV channels. Uh, so suddenly we kind of became uh, popular there. Uh, but the most attractive part of this application for me is that there are needs in the world in remote locations for either small farmers or in disastrous zones when you have a disaster or you know the, the locations where they don't have access to resources. But they also need fresh food, locally grown food, um, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and immediate food. So we can come up with designs, portable systems, uh, deployable systems, which can operate, take advantage of renewable energy sources to do the production in those remote sec settings and disastrous zones. And this, this is an example of that. You know, we can use a more simplified system with not much electronics going on, but still uh, have a portable deployable system uh, to produce food uh, locally, fresh, in remote locations. So that's the most attractive part of this application for me. Uh, so I would like to conclude with this slide to say that we need to include plants and their responses in the control uh, processes and in decision-making process. I don't mean to replace a human operator because human is a perfect, the most experienced operator. But we can help the operator with sensing and monitoring to make better judgments to use resources more efficiently. So in that case, we can use uh, a, a sensing system looking at the whole continuum, the supply conditions, the plant itself, and the demand conditions, sending this data to the computer. The computer can look at also other informations and the trends of the data in the system, the ventilation, heating, and you know, uh, the, uh, the lighting conditions, the plant status, and making some economics calculations uh, to make a decision and actuate the system. So this process would be more efficient uh, in terms of saving resources. In controlled environment plant production system, the technological success can be achieved by engineering and horticultural knowledge. Uh, the economic success, we need marketing and uh, sales skills. However, but well, for me, I think the most important part is the production success and the utilization of these uh, uh, technologies. Uh, we need well-educated and experienced workforce. That is one of the, our main challenge in the U.S. We need educated people. We need trained people in controlled environments and in every aspect, with horticulture background, engineering background, marketing skills, and, and business skills to operate these structures and uh, the, good, the good production, high quality production, and capture the market. So that's what we need to, to be able to compete 
and, and survive in this, in this challenging market. And the, I think this is where you all uh, stand. It's where we need everybody. Well, I was looking at the, uh, the curriculums in the United States. Most of the courses actually are offered by horticulture programs. 93% of the courses in controlled environments is offered in the United States by horticulture programs. But we need also more people uh, 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 going into engineering programs too. There are only 3% courses uh, offered by engineering programs. We need students from engineering technology programs. We need people from business programs as well to, to make this really happen and stay competitive in the um, controlled environment uh, plant production business. With that, I would like to conclude my presentation and answer the questions that you have. And thank you. Mm -hmm. and how, uh, I mean, this is, this yeah. is for huge growers, yeah. correct? Um, is there an okay. Well, um, if you look at the, the world uh, uh, greenhouse applications, uh, I, I gave you an example of European system. The Europe is much ahead of the uh, scheme because they survive in these hard times, especially with the economics, you know, the financial situations with their technology. They are able to operate the systems with lesser amount of people. So they are more resource use efficient. They don't require too many labor force to operate the system. So they come up with engineered systems, smarter systems, efficient systems to, to stay competitive. If you look at Canada, for example, they get subsidizes from the government. They have programs, you know, political support from the government uh, to, to, for their operations. So you need that to be able to stay competitive against a, 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 a situations like in Mexico, you know, they, they have the cheap, you know, uh, low cost labor force and they are able to provide the produce to the market. So in order to, to stay competitive, uh, you need to come up with those uh, high efficient systems. And that comes from, you know, en with engineering skills, with knowledge. You, you need to compete with knowledge against a, a situation like this in, in places like you know Mexico or other you know countries in terms of greenhouse production. So some of the things that I showed you, y yes, you know it really requires some investment, some you know applications in maybe uh, large scale operations, but some of them we can still use it for small scale and uh, medium medium sized scale operations as well, uh, with sensors and sensing techniques. But they're really getting cheap right now. I mean, um, you, can, you can deploy some of these sensors and sensing networks in your operation uh, and, and get some data which would be helpful to you to automate things uh, and improve your efficiency. That's what I'm saying, uh, you know. Um, yeah, some of them are for complex systems, for larger systems. I, I'm not sure if I answered. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. Uh, so the sensors we are using in that computer vision system? Yeah, whenever you uh, take the image mm -hmm. to the... Uh, okay, when you take the image? Uh, yeah. uh, how do you make sure that the lighting is controlled? Yes, very good point. Yes, lighting is an issue. If you are working in the, uh, uh, in the greenhouse setting, you have lighting, uh, non-uniformity, and you also have shading from the structural elements uh, on the canopy. So. Um, in, the, in the application that we had, we had uniform light conditions, but uh, you can have a light source, um, an LED source or a light source to, uh, you know, uh, take a, use it when you're taking the image to make it more uniform. Or we can do a nighttime detection, um, uh, but that will reduce your resolution uh, uh, also in the application. Light is an issue. Some of that light non-uniformity can be uh, um, eliminated through image processing applications. There is way to uh, do an uh, uh, image uh, equalization process uh, to eliminate that effect and remove shading effect on the plant. If you have an occluding leaves, you can 
do some image processing to separate that, to get that information. So some of them is from image processing, some you need additional supplemental equipment to, uh, to make it more uniform and homogeneous to, to get good quality images. But it's a challenging task. And that's one of the steps actually we, we will more you know, tap into in the future research. Thank you, good question. Have you thought about using something like microcilia, uh, fungus in the, in the Earth's surface to gauge the condition of the soil plants surrounding it? No, I never thought about it. Interesting. He's an engineer. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. So that's something for the top science mm. But <coughs> you can use it, I think. Or <laughs> yeah. It will be interesting actually to do um, automatic air sampling to look at some spores and fungus, uh, you know, development on the plant. Um, there are sensors to look at volatiles to, you know, look at that and, and relate that to the plant disease and, and health conditions too. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. plants. Um, I come from a manufacturing mm -hmm. background okay. and I was in coffee manufacturing so uh, one of the processes we moved the coffee pouches mm -hmm. in front of a vision, vision camera. Okay. I'm trying to figure out how do you do that with plants that mm -hmm. are not going to move anywhere, right? No. So no. In this case we bring the camera to the to the plant. Um, or or right now, there are um, very small cameras, um, FPGA systems, field programmable logic devices. They are really tiny, teeny, uh, like the size of a quarter. They have cameras on them, and they are very cheap. Um, and we can deploy them in, in greenhouses and communicate uh, through that network uh, wirelessly, and then be able to uh, scan the uh, production domain. So okay. you know, plants wouldn't, yeah. Sampling from the domain and then um, getting a real-time image and analyzing that. Uh, it wouldn't be practical, of course, to bring the plants into into the camera chamber. If you're doing a research, that's possible. In phenotyping greenhouses, they actually do that. They bring with conveyor belts the plants to the can to the uh, camera uh, system, and they take images and they go back to the greenhouse. Uh, but in most commercial settings, it's not practical, of course. Uh, but yeah, we 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 use wireless systems or bring the camera to the plant in this case. Yeah. Any other yes, questions? another question. Thank you, Thank you so much <laughs> for having me here. Thank you. Yeah. And if you have more questions, please send me an email and uh, come to our short course. That's every uh, April. Uh, we have it listed on our website. Uh, you can have information about that and each year the topic changes depending on the interest coming from the public. Last year it was urban agriculture, vertical farming. There is a really, it's a really hot topic right now. Um, so, you're welcome.